evening, all. Hello again. Hey. Oh, cool. All right. Kicking off our early, late morning, beginning afternoon festivities here at the Women's Center is a fabulous craft lecture from Randall Keenan. Welcome. <laughs> I, I knew I was going to get in trouble, and Steve Yarber already dinged me for um, passing out poetry, and I'm, I don't have any right to do that. Um, if this had a title, I would probably be Let the Mystery Be or Death by Murder. Um, I, what I want to talk about, well, Mary Jo is already told us she's going to talk about ekphrasis, and I use it in class in a different way. So yours is going to be much more technical. Mine is much more homespun. Um, but I, I talk, we're going to talk about plot, character, storytelling. And I realized after I was doing this that what I'm really talking about is mystery. Um, and as I say, I, 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 I'm not a poet. And I want to look at these songs as story. And it's a very specific form of storytelling. And um, one of my friends, I went to school with a woman named um, Melanie Sumner, and we both admitted to each other that we envy singers. We, we, what we really want to do is sing because there's no gap between the emotion and what the singer is singing. And we have to go through all sorts of hoops and, and, and all around our elbow to get to the emotion. And so um, that's one of the reasons that I'm doing this. I had two teaching experiences that were really transformative for me personally. One was the intermediate nonfiction writing class. And uh, I don't think there was a prompt, but this young woman wanted to write about a haunted house in Winston-Salem. She was from Winston-Salem. And she wrote this very good piece, but what the piece was really about was the fact that she went home to Winston-Salem and got her father involved. And her father went with her to sit up and, at this house, sit in the car and wait for the ghost to arrive. And ultimately, the piece was not about the ghost. I mean, we forgot about the ghost. It was about how much this father loved his daughter and how he would do anything for her. And it was this really beautiful portrait of the father. So when we workshopped the story, we got into this discussion, the class did, about ghost stories and what they mean and everything. And the next thing I knew, for the rest of the semester, we kept getting these ghost stories. But they were cracked open. They were they were experimental. They were getting at the ghosts in a different, different, different way. I really enjoyed that. The other time was a senior honors writing seminar. And we do, for the seniors, we do, they do a year-long class where they produce, you know, a collection of stories or a novel or what have you. And this young woman, Sarah, wrote this story about set during the Depression, small town. This young woman who's not very prepossessing, um, comes from a very religious family. Um, she she you know is oppressed by her uh, her family. They go to you know a lot of church going and whatnot, and in walks this beautiful young man from the next town next town over, who sweeps her off her feet, and they get married. Of course, he's the devil, <laughs> um, and he oppresses her, and it becomes this horrible thing, and she winds up killing him. And I said, Sarah. Do you know what you've written a murder a murder ballad? And all these young people, they're born in the 21st century. They didn't know what the hell I was talking about. And so I go into the English ballad tradition and how it was transplanted over to Appalachia, North Carolina. You get Doc Boggs, you get Doc Watson, you get Hazel Dickens, all these wonderful people. And I put together a playlist of all these wonderful murder ballads. Don't you know I read about more killing in that semester, <laughs> and I have it all my life. But it was wonderful, it was wonderful that they had fed off each other. And it wasn't about me, it was about them and their creativity and using another art form to get at something. And, and if you want a story, you know, kill somebody. Um, the oldest murder in the Western tradition is Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel because he's jealous. And, and God comes out, where is Abel? God says, I mean, and Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? 
God was messing with him. You, you know God knew where Abel was. <laughs> but, um, um, so the spirit... <laughs> That always bothered me. <laughs> Why are you asking me? Well, you know. Um, so I have given you three songs I want to talk about. All of them are contemporary songs. They're not the traditional murder ballads. I actually thought about, because I was going to use Frankie and Johnny, which is about a more food. But these are, I think these are much more interesting. Um, the first one is actually written by Sting but it was performed by Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash did these wonderful Americana albums just before he died. This is on the third one, I think. Um, and if you go listen to things, it's not gonna be good as this. Uh-oh. Early one morning, with time to kill, I borrowed Jeb's rifle and sat on the hill. I saw a lone rider crossing the plain. I drew a bead on him to practice my aim. My brother's rifle went off in my hand. A shot rang out across the land. The horse he kept running, the rider was dead. I hung my head, I hung my head. I set off running to wake from the dream. My brother's rifle went into the sheen. I kept on running into the Southlands. That's where they found me, my head in my hands. The sheriff, he asked me, why had I run? And then it came to me, just what I had done. And all for no reason, just one piece of lead. I hung my head, I hung my head. Here in the courthouse, the whole town was there. I see the judge high up in his chair. Explain to the courtroom what went through your mind. And we'll ask the jury what verdict they find. I felt the power of death over life. I orphaned his children. I widowed his wife. I beg their forgiveness. I wish I was dead. I hung my head. I hung my head. I hung my head. I hung my head. Early one morning, with time to kill. I see the gallows up on the hill And out in the distance a trick of the brain I see a lone rider crossing the plain And he come to fetch me to see what they done And we'll ride together till kingdom come I pray for God's mercy cause soon I'll be dead I hung my head I hung my head, I hung my head, I hung my There's no malice. It's an accidental death. There is death, but there's no malice in this song. But you get all those Aristotelian points. You get recognition. You get reckoning with a consequence. You get retribution. You get regret. And I think you even get redemption. 
I mean, he, in a way, he's redeemed um, in, that, in that way. Um, the next one I want to, um, oh, and, this, and the story is it's about agency. Um, and you don't have a story unless you have some, the main character has, the protagonist has to have some type of agency. It's not just about the world doing you wrong. It's what you do in response to what is being done to you. Um, now, I, again, I, I realized that this, this was, I was walking on very thin ice by doing this because there's a battle between lyrics and poetry and you get two poets arguing about whether lyrics or poetry and this all that sort of thing. Uh, I ain't got no dog in that fight. But, um, but I, I, the next one I'm proud to say, uh, G Gillian Welch, I've been a fan of hers forever. And I nominated her for an award we have at University of North Carolina. And we've given it to Joan Didion, we've given it to Tom Wolfe, we've given it to Joe McCorkle, the Thomas Wolfe Prize. And so I nominated her for the Thomas Wolfe Prize. And you know, speaking of Bob Dylan, um, they, they agreed to give it to her. And I just find this song so remarkable and it cracks open the whole murder ballad thing in an entirely new way. Another one bites the dust. Um, but it's so interesting. I mean, this is about female empowerment. It's about survivor, of survival. Um, the aggressor, the original aggressor in the song is the one who gets done in. Um, you have characterization. You know that he's a, he's a horrible man. Um, and, and you know something about, about the, the, the narrator. Um, and whether or not he's an actual ghost is something up for debate, even though Tony and I will argue about that all night. Because uh, he could be gets a part of her, her psychology, the guilt. that she killed, that she murdered this guy? Yeah, it doesn't have to be a ghost, but I like it if it is a ghost. <laughs> um, so that, say what? He's a ghost, he's a ghost. He's a ghost. <laughs> okay. It makes it more interesting if he's a ghost. Um, so we'll go on to Bobby Gentry, 1970. This was a huge hit, huge hit. 
Uh, and every 10 years, somebody will write an article, Bobby Gentry is alive and well in Mississippi, and she still ain't told us anything about who Billy jo what happened to Billy Joe. So. When I was six, we moved to another region in Mississippi called the Delta. And we lived between two rivers. One was the Yazoo, and the other was the Tallahatchie. It was the third of June, another sleepy, dusty Delta day. I was out chopping cotton and my brother was baling hay. And at dinner time we stopped and walked back to the house to eat. And mama hollered at the back door, y'all remembered and wiped your feet. And then she said, I got some news this morning from Choctaw Ridge. Today, Billy Joe McAllister jumped off the Tallahatchie Bridge. And Papa said to Mama as he passed around the Black Eyed Peas, Oh, Billy Joe never had liquor since. Pass the biscuits, please. There's five more acres in the lower 40 I got to plan. Mama said it was a shame about Billy Joe in the Seems like nothing ever comes to no good up on Choctaw Ridge. And now Billy Joe McAllister jumped off the Tallahatchie. Brother said he recollected he and Tom and Billy Joe put a frog down the back at the Carroll County Picture Show. And wasn't I talking to him after church last Sunday night? I'll have another piece of apple pie. You know, it don't seem right. I saw him at the sawmill yesterday up on Choctaw Ridge. And now you tell me Billy Joe's jumped off the Tallahatchie Bridge. Mama said to me, child, what's happened to your appetite? Well, I've been cooking all morning and you haven't touched a single bite. That nice young preacher, Brother Taylor, dropped by today. So you be pleased to have dinner on Sunday. Oh, by the way, he said he saw a girl that looked a lot like you up on Choctaw Ridge. And she and Billy Joe was throwing something on the tail at Jeep Bridge. A year has come and gone since we heard the news about Billy Joe. And brother Mary Becky Thompson they bought a store in Tupelo. There was a virus going round. Papa caught it and he died last spring. And now Mama doesn't seem to want to do much of anything. And me, I spend a lot of time picking flowers up on Choctaw Ridge. Into the muddy water off the Tallahatchie Bridge. Well, the 
first thing to say, I mean, there's so much to unpack in here. I have a friend who teaches at Alabama who thinks this song is the height of kitsch, but I, I, I beg to disagree. Um, I mean, the wonderful sense of place, I mean, Steve Yarborough was just thinking about home. <laughs> all, the, all these markers of Mississippi. Um, the story is told a year after the suicide. We don't know why Billy Joe committed suicide. Um, and, and she has this, this sort of mischievous, mischievous subversive element of the, the murder, the, the suicide is always in, in the background. They're talking about food and eating and having to plow fields and that sort of thing. And so what's that? And it's really about her. Um, the, the, the person who's telling the story, not about the suicide, that almost is, is immaterial. And people have gone through all sorts of, um, permutations of what the songs mean and what they were throwing off the bridge and all sorts of ideas about abortion and things. And I guess you guys, most of you know, or some of you know, a lot of you know, that Max Baer Jr. made this into a film in the early 70s starring Robbie Benson and actually wrote an essay for Southern Cultures magazine, Robbie Benson Made Me Gay, <laughs> about that movie. <laughs> But um, so there you have it. <laughs> but we don't know. The mystery is there, and that's what I that's what I realized that um, what I, I was really talking about with this with this um, talk is mystery. Um, if, imagine if you if this were, this story were in workshop, most people would be so dissatisfied not knowing what the hell happened. <laughs> you. If you wrote this story, you'd be under so much pressure to tell us what happened, damn it. Uh, we had that happen yesterday with some stories. People just don't want it, don't, don't, can't live with mystery. All three of these stories are told in the first person. They're, they're um, essentially uh, 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 confessions. And they're also somewhat existential in, in nature. And existentialism has mystery at its core. Uh, and they're also, on some level, have to do with sin. My professor in college, Louis Rubin, always teased me. He said, oh boy, you just want to preach. You want to save people's lives. And I'm, it's not about that, but I do believe that redemption is a, a powerful current in fiction, in narrative prose. Uh, it comes up often. And you can't have redemption unless you have some sin. As James Baldwin said, uh, there's, everyone has trouble in their life. You're, believe it or not, your trouble is going to come. So retribution, all of those in the Western tradition, um, in the Bible, there are all these stories of retribution. Um, but it's not just a Christian impulse. You find it in Hinduism. You find it in Shintoism. What we don't know is a great motivation. What we can't know, what we will never know, uh, these mysteries of the universe. Uh, I l love going back to Flannery O'Connor. She has a wonderful collection of essays called Manners and Mysteries. Um, and she probably delved into mysteries more than any, anybody else. But we are geared to want answers. And ration not knowing is somehow a crime. Um, how do we deal with mystery? And how does mystery deal with us? I think of Faulkner's A Rose for Emily. The actual story is that this woman slept with his dead body. She probably committed, she probably killed him. But the real mystery is, why did he sleep with him? All these, I mean, that's the, the, the really. um, <laughs> I think of a story I use in class all the time, A Worn Path. And Eudora Welty herself wrote a famous essay about whether or not Phoenix Jackson's grandson is really dead. You don't know, it's a mystery. Uh, whether or not she's going through all this out of, she's, you know, addled in brain. Um, with a, back to O'Connor, um, a, a good man is hard to find. I didn't say that. <laughs> um, or a view, <laughs> a, a view of the woods. This evil man, granddaddy, and his evil daughter. And it, it, it's, it's a mystery. Um, I was talking with Brittany about uh, one of Toni Morrison's lesser known novels, Jazz. And again, I was talking about Frankie and Johnny, Amor Fu, why this man kills his wife or his lover um, is at the center of it. Uh, but also, if you think about Before Beloved, Song of Solomon. I mean, that book is just woven together with mystery. 
Um, and then, again, going back to more food or sin, killing, uh, Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God. Um, Janie Crawford has to kill the man who has rabies. Uh, and then, you know, so I was also thinking that the idea of faith is at the center of this and mystery. Um, faith and mystery are bound up in, in, inexorably. Faith, as the apostle tells us, is the evidence of things unseen and the substance of things yet to come. And I know I'm sounding like I'm preaching, but there's never been a bigger sinner standing before you than me. Um, physicists hate it when you use the Heisenberg uncertainty principle as a metaphor, because they say, you know, you just re you're just reducing quantum mechanics, and that's, you, you can't do that. But it's true. It's, I mean, Heisenberg said you can never know where an electron is. You can tell where it has been. You can tell where it's going to be. But in order to figure out where it is, you have to interfere with it. Um, mystery. We are not comfortable with mystery, and yet the best storytelling has mystery at its center. And the best storytellers, uh, I, Dostoevsky, yes, Tolstoy, he's hard to figure out, but Chekhov, Chekhov honored mystery in a way that very few people did. And I would like to, well, I'm gonna end, I have two endings. One is uh, I'm gonna read the last lines from Uncle Vanya. Uh, and the play is not about what the play is about, as Dan will tell you. The play is about what I'm about to read you, and is given to Sonia, the long-suffering housekeeper, who is really the heart, the beating heart of the play. What can we do? We must live our lives. Yes, we shall live, Uncle Vanya. We shall live through the long procession of days before us and through the long evenings. We shall patiently bear the trials that fate imposes on us. We shall work for others without rest, both now and when we are old. Chekhov thought this was a comedy, by the way. <laughs> and when our last hour comes, we shall meet it humbly and there, beyond the grave, we shall say that we have suffered and wept, that our life was bitter, and God will have pity on us. Ah, then, dear, dear uncle, we shall see that bright and beautiful life. We shall rejoice and look back upon our sorrow here, a tender smile, and we shall rest. I have faith, uncle, fervent, passionate faith. We shall rest, we shall rest. We shall hear the angels. We shall see the heavens spinning, shining like a jewel. We shall see all evil and all our pain sink away with great compassion that shall enfold the world. Our life will be as peaceful and tender and sweet as a caress. I have faith, I have faith. You have never known what happiness was. But wait, Uncle Vanya, wait. We shall rest. We shall rest. Some say you rest in the arms of the Savior if in sinful ways you lack. Some say that they're coming back in a garden, bunch of carrots and little sweet peas. I think I'll just let the mystery be. <laughs> 